Yeah? There we go. Okay. Great. All right, so our text for tonight is from 2 Peter chapter 1, um, starting in verse 3. So if you could stand for the reading of God's Word. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you, are ne you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remain standing as we pray. <coughs> Father, what a joy it is to be here tonight and to sing the works that you have wrought in the past for our sakes. We've sang of how you've brought us out of death and into life through your Son, and that you have built the foundation in your word for us to follow. And we have seen um, that you have granted to us your spirit and that you have promised to persevere us to the end, Father. And as we come to your word tonight, I pray that your spirit would indeed come and would speak to our hearts the truth that you would have us here. I pray all this for our good and for your glory. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. There's a certain phrase that has enjoyed some popularity in recent years among Christians. I'm sure you've probably all heard of it, um, maybe long ago, but you've heard of it. Let go and let God. And I want to think about that phrase for just a second, the, the idea that we should let go and let God. It appeals to a couple of things. Um, one thing it appeals to is an easier way of life. And that's probably why it's become popular among a lot of people in America today. You know, let go, let God. It appeals to an easier way of life. But let's not get too hard on the phrase. It also appeals to something very foundational, right? The sovereignty of God. You know, it stems from the idea that we should let go of, you know, the things that we think that are in our control because they're really not. They're in God's control. And so it's not necessarily the phrase itself that could be the problem, but the way in which it is used. So specifically tonight, I want to think about the application of this phrase, let go and let God, to the continual, lifelong, daily battle of sanctification. Peter in no way expects his readers to let go and let God when it comes to their sanctification. I think it can be really easy for us, if we don't use this phrase, even to let this sort of thinking creep into the way that we think, isn't it? Think back to a time in your life when you're just overcome by a certain sin, or temptation, or doubt, or anxiety, it just kept staring you in the face. You've done everything that you know to get past this thing. Perhaps it's anger or bitterness towards someone who's wronged you. Perhaps it's a lust or just um, a temptation to fear things that you shouldn't. That you should let, let God, um, God's peace take over, but you're tempted to fear. Think back to a time in your life when you had this thing that just hangs over your head day in and day out. You felt as if it might destroy you altogether. Your hope was fading. You felt as if you were being suffocated by it. I'm sure we've all felt this way at some point in the past, and some of us might even be there right now. Nothing you did seemed to help. You prayed, you confessed, you found somebody to pray with you. You did everything that you seemed that you could do, everything that you've been told to do, 
but still this thing, this sin, was staring you in the face. I can think of no other time in our lives when we might be more tempted to grab hold of this phrase, let go and let God. And no more time when it's more dangerous to apply it to our lives. I mean, just think about it. It's real tempting, right? When we're going through this valley of sin, when we've been fighting the fight, we want to do something right. It's tempting to let go and say, perhaps that's the problem. Perhaps I'm fighting too hard. Perhaps I just need to let go and let God take over. How tempting this can be. How tempting it sounds to let God take over our exhausting battle of sin. After all, isn't He the one who has this great power? Isn't this what we've been singing about? The power of God? Aren't we the weak ones? Aren't we the sinners who are frail and unable to attain? How easy it can be to even become bitter against our Lord for our own failings. Because we've been told that we can overcome this thing through the Spirit, but we might even become bitter because it's still there. How wicked our hearts can be. How twisted, because of our own sin, we can even become bitter against our Lord. But perhaps we're tempted to think that it must be our fault. Maybe we're trying too hard. Maybe he just wants him to trust. Maybe he just wants us to trust him more. Maybe if we stepped back from our fight, he would take over for us. Maybe our struggles would vanish if we just lessened our efforts a bit and increased our faith in him. You see how this sort of thinking can just kind of creep in to the way that we think about our daily battles against sin? But in these times when we feel like the battle against sin is all but hopeless, the question remains, what are we called to do? Are we called to lessen our efforts so that our faith might increase and God's strength take over? Will that really help us in our fight against sin? I think 2 Peter chapter 1 answers this question so clearly for us. After reminding us of the power of the gospel in our lives, Peter writes in verse 5, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And he goes on with a, a whole list of things to add to our faith. I think this exhortation, this verse, is the centerpiece of his message to us. That we, as Christians, should be a people who make every effort to add to our faith. I'll say that again. As Christians, we are called to be a people who make every effort to add to our faith. Now, my goal this evening is to help us understand the reasons behind Peter's exhortation. Why, does, why do I think it's so dangerous for us to think into this idea of letting go and letting God, as opposed to what Peter would have us do to make every effort in these times of trials and tribulations? What's his reasoning for telling us this? Well, I think Peter makes his reasons very clear in verse 3 and 4 that our efforts have their foundation in the very great and precious promises of Jesus Christ. Our efforts have their foundation in the very great and precious promises of Jesus Christ. Look again at verse 3. He says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises. Praise God. Are you tempted to despair in your fight against sin? Listen to what this is saying. It's saying that His power has been granted to you. Your efforts don't stem from yourselves. If you're in Christ, you're, you have God's own divine power. It's been granted to you. This is His reasoning behind making this exhortation later in verse 5 that His divine power has been granted to us. And I can think of no better place in Scripture to help us just get a better sense of God's power than Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 12. So you can turn there with me if you'd like. Um, but I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 12. And this just gives such a good picture of who God is, who has granted us this power. It is God. 
starting in verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span, and closed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. Now skip over to verse 25. It says, To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him? says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see, this is the reason Peter can begin... In verse 5, making this exhortation to make every effort. Listen to the strength that we've been given. He has n named all the stars of the heavens. And He has given us His divine power. Praise God for this gift. But Peter not only wants to remind us of this, of this gift, but he also wants to remind us of how we have received this gift. We read on. He says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. All of us here with faith began with a call, right? We were called by Christ to follow Him. So what does this call mean? I want to point out one specific thing about those words um, there in verse 3. He says He has called us to His own glory and excellence. That word excellence in the Greek is actually the same word in, down in verse 5 that is translated virtue. And so this word in the Greek actually carries with it both of these understandings of excellence and virtue. So if you can kind of put those two together, we can reread this verse 3 maybe with this understanding that He has called us to His own glory and to His moral excellence. He has called us to His moral excellence. What a high calling Christ's excellence is one that is absolutely perfect. He has no spot, no stain, no wrinkle. A shining white garment with nothing imperfect. This is what we are called to imitate. This is what we as Christians have been called to. What a high calling, right? To imitate Christ in His glory and His excellence. John Bunyan paints an excellent picture of the Christian life in his book, The Pilgrim's Progress. And in this book, a man named Christian is terribly burdened down by two things. If, you, if you've read it, you probably know what I'm talking about. But the first thing he's burdened down with is the knowledge that his city is going to be burned with fire from heaven. And this is terrible, terrible knowledge, right? If you know that your city is going to be burned with fire from heaven, you need to do something about this. And the second thing he's burdened down with is just a great weight of guilt that is upon his back. And he cannot remove it. But then Christian experiences a call. He is told to leave his town and journey to a city. To journey towards a celestial city. And he is told that the way lies through the gate of faith. That's the name of the gate. is through faith. And so Christian goes on this journey. He enters in through the gate of faith. And after entering into the way to the city, he comes upon a cross on a hill. And as soon as he looks upon this cross, that weight that has been bearing him down his entire life falls off of his back. 
And he just experiences unprecedented joy like he's never felt in his life. And isn't this our conversion experience? Coming to the cross in faith and the guilt that we have had falls off of our back. What a beautiful picture of our calls to follow Christ. We have entered into the way through faith and the guilt of our sin has been removed. Because of the moral perfection of Christ and his death being had in our place, we no longer carry the burden of guilt upon our backs. But not only that, but we have been given his precious and very great promises. This is what Peter goes on to next. That we have been given his precious and very great promises. After reminding us of our call to imitate Christ in his glory and in his perfection, he goes on to say that we are granted his precious and very great promises. And what, ne- what comes next makes, makes me think that he has one specific promise in mind. Listen to what comes next. He says, so that through them, the precious and very great promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now, what is Peter getting at? This partaking of the divine nature. And I've kind of hinted at it a little bit, but he starts off with his divine power has been granted to us. But how? How has it come through us? I think Peter is clearly talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God. And this promise has its roots deep in the Old Testament. Listen to the words of Ezekiel. He says, And I will give them one heart, and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes, and keep my rules, and obey them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Once we receive the call to follow Christ, we're not just left there, but we're given the very person of God to dwell in us. This is where this power comes from. This is why Peter can say, His divine power has been granted to you. Because through faith, you have received the Holy Spirit. The very person of God dwells within you. So we have seen that Peter wanted to ground our efforts in the promises of Christ, in our original faith, in answering the call to follow Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit that comes through faith. He doesn't want us to forget that we at first came to Christ in faith with nothing but our sin. Right? We don't enter into the way coming with some works to bring, but we enter in through the gate of faith, trusting that our works are hopeless. Our efforts to change our hearts were meaningless and hopeless. We come to Him with empty hands, looking only to the cross for our good, for our justification. But what then are we now to do? We have seen and heard of the magnificent ways in which God is working in and through us to produce good. Can't we just be thankful and let Him do His thing? After all, He is the one with the power to do good. Going back to that way of thinking, let go and let God. He has given us such great things. How does the text read? Does it read, for this very reason, sit back and watch God do amazing things as you surrender control to Him? We can sometimes talk that way, can't we? But that's not how the text reads. If the text read that way, think back to Christian. We would expect this big, white, fluffy cloud to come down to the cross where he is with no guilt on his back anymore, and he's just living life. He hops onto this cloud, maybe sits back and lounges, and it takes him up into the sky, right? And then he journeys across all these hills and valleys along the path of, that he has been called to go down, and he's just dropped in front of the celestial city. But that's not what happens, is it? If you've read the Pilgrim's Progress, you know what happens. You know that Christian plunges into the valley of the shadow of death where it's utter darkness and he can see nothing. But all he hears is gnashing of teeth and demons whispering torment to him and threatening him. And then he comes to the the, uh, servant of Satan, Apollyon, where he wages war against him with the sword of faith and and the shield. Then he makes it out of the valley of the shadow of death and he comes to the city of Vanity Fair 
where he is met with men of the world who are giving in to their lusts and um, they tempt him in all the things and the pleasures of the world. And eventually when he refuses, they lock him up and they beat him for refusing. And eventually even they kill his companion faithful right before his eyes. But eventually he escapes from the city and then further down on the way, he steps off of the path for a second. He sins and he forgets his true way and he ends up in the castle of doubt um, held there by the giant despair. Isn't this our Christian lives? We don't ride on white fluffy clouds to heaven after we come to the cross. We plunge into the valleys of darkness where sin's all around us. We're tempted by the men of the world. We step off of the path for a second and we get consumed with doubt of where we were going. We forget our purpose and we're consumed with doubt. And this is the normal Christian life. So how does the text read? It says in verse 5, Because of our calling and the power that we've been given through the Holy Spirit, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Now, we don't have time to go through each one of these things in the list, but I want to point out just a good way to come at this list that will help us. And it's simply this, that our efforts are to be added to our faith through love. That our efforts are to be added to our faith through love. And there's really two parts to this statement. The first one is that these things are to be added to our faith. And I've stressed this already, but how tempting is it for us to come to lists like this and to already want to jump back to the law, to times when we want to make ourselves better before God? How easy is it to come to a list of things that we should do as Christians and want to come at them as a way to improve our standing before God, to make ourselves better Christians, maybe? We'll think about it that way. But that is not the point of this list. Right? It starts with faith. Aren't we forgetting that? If we come at this list as a list of things to do to better ourselves before God, we're forgetting what it starts with. We came with nothing in our hands. We came as utterly hopeless before Him. And our faith is in the fact that Jesus died and paid that penalty so that we as Christians could have our hope entirely in His work of justification. There is no improving our standing before God by our efforts in practicing these things. Christian, as he was on his journey to the celestial city, met with a man whom he saw enter into the way by coming over a wall. This man didn't want to journey all the way back to the gate of faith, but he came in over a wall. And Christian saw this and knew this wasn't good. And so he went to the man and asked him, Why are you coming in through over the wall? Why didn't you come in through the gate? This is where you're supposed to start. And the man said, I dwell in the town of morality. I dwell in the town of morality. And people from that town don't go by that way. They come in over the wall. And this has become a well-respected way to come into the way. I'm afraid that we as Christians in America, as a culture, have become people of the town of morality. That instead of wanting to come to the humbling conclusion that we have nothing to bring to Christ, that we want to bring something, we want to bring our efforts. We want to bring our acts of morality to the table. But that is not the way. Our Lord calls these, these men thieves and robbers who think that they can imitate the Christian life without ever coming into the way through faith. So don't come to a list like this in 2 Peter without forgetting that. But I said that our efforts are to be added to our faith through love. That's the second part of this point. Through love. This list is bracketed by two things. It starts with faith, and then it ends with love. That's the culmination of this list. Paul says, If I have all faith, that can move mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. 
When asked what the greatest commandment was, Jesus answered, To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second, to love your neighbor as yourself. So what is the point of this list? All of these things that we have, if they're not to improve our standing before God, what's the point? The point is to show love to one another. That is the point of this list. We seek for virtue so that we can show kindness and patience and gentleness to one another. Because that is how we show love. We seek for self-control. Because each time we sin, we are hurting the body. We seek for steadfastness so that we might provide courage to those among us who are tempted to despair. We seek for godliness so that others might come to know God for who He is by watching us. We seek for brotherly affection so that we might show God's love in a personal, intimate way with one another. You see, each thing in this list is another way to show love to one another. That is the point of this list. But you cannot truly show love unless you have experienced the love of Christ yourself. That's why it's so important to come into this list through faith. We cannot imitate these things unless we've experienced the love of God becoming man, dying for our sins because we chose to sin over obe obeying Him. He gave His life to redeem us. Until you've experienced that love, there's no way to produce these things on this list. That is why we must come through faith. But Peter goes on. Now that he has made absolutely sure that we understand faith to be necessary to our efforts, and that the promised Holy Spirit is the power behind our efforts, he wants to leave us with the outcome of our efforts as motivation to persevere in them. And what he wants to make clear is that our efforts will validate our faith. That is ultimately what he's getting at that our efforts will validate our faith. See, the end of this list, Peter then draws a line in the sand. And he says, all of you over here, you have these things. You're increasing in them. But all of you over here, you don't have these things. You don't possess these qualities. Listen to how the text reads. He says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, those people over here, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities, those over here, they are so nearsighted that they are blind, having forgotten that they were cleansed from their former sins. He's clearly speaking about two different types of people here, right? So first, let's think about those who possess these qualities. The first thing he points out about them is that there's room for improvement. He says, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, he makes no provision for the person who claims to have attained them, but those who have them and are increasing. Think about what happens during the process of conversion. A sinner living in rebellion has come to God through faith and has been granted life. It's almost as if a crippled man who's never walked a day in his life has been granted the ability to walk. And then he's immediately asked to run a race that's like 500 miles long. We can imagine the, how we would feel, right? Are you kidding me? He just learned how to walk, and now you're telling him to run this crazy long race. But think about us. We were dead in our sins and raised to life, and then we're immediately told to imitate Christ in his moral perfection. That's almost more absurd, right? I don't have any practice at being perfect. I'm sorry. Just like this guy who's never walked before a day in his life says, I, I can't run. I've never done that before in my life. Don't we feel that way? When we come and said, I don't have any practice being perfect. But look at what's expected of us. Look, look in verse 10. He says, if you practice these things, you will never fall. We're not expected to immediately master them. Paul picks up on the same kind of theme in 1 Timothy 4.7. He says to Timothy, train yourself in godliness. You see, just like it would be crazy to expect a man who just learned how to walk to run a race the next day that's like 500 miles long, it would be crazy to expect us to be absolutely perfect our first day as a Christian. But there will be improvement as we practice these things. Let's push this running analogy just a little bit further. Um, if you've just began 
training, or if you've ever trained before for a race, you know that just when you first begin to train, then you start to get a whole lot faster at the beginning, right? Because there's a lot of room for improvement. But to the Olympic athlete who has the world record in marathon um, time, it's going to be take like a grueling effort to get any faster at all. So think about those of you where you are right now along that path, maybe somewhere in the middle. But the farther down you get, the more intense your efforts must be. Right? So I want to encourage you, no matter where you are, to continue to make every effort in your sanctification. We must not become complacent in our training, no matter where we are. If you're like me, you may be tempted at this point to ask, well, why not? Why can I not become complacent? What kind of motivation do I have to continue to make every effort? I mean, after all, I'm in this camp. I'm not over here. I have these qualities. I'm practicing them. They're a part of me. Others see it and have told me. I know I'm clinging to faith. Why must I not become complacent in my training? Listen to the motivation Peter gives us in verse 11. He says, For in this way, that is by practicing these things, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, if you're like me at this point, another question jumps into your mind. I'm full of questions. Isn't he tying our entrance into heaven with our works? Doesn't that sound like what he's doing? Listen again. For in this way, that is by practicing these things, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The simple answer to that question is yes. He is tying our entrance into heaven with our works. How do we make sense of this? Well, let's look at other places in Scripture where the same ideas come up. Look at Romans 2, 6-8. He says, He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. And Jesus says to the church in Revelation, chapter 2, verse 23, And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. What are these passages getting at? How do we make sense of these two facts? One, that our faith is by justification alone, and the other, that we will be judged by what we do. We will be judged by our works. And I think the ideas of how we can tie these two things together is most simply summed up in the statement that our efforts will validate our faith. That our efforts will validate our faith. And this is so clearly seen in this text. We don't have to go other places to see this. Let's look at now at those who don't possess these qualities. Look what Peter says about them in verse 9. He says that they have become blind, forgetting that they were cleansed from their former sins. So what's his conclusion that he's making? These people who don't possess these qualities, their works show that they're not of faith. They've forgotten the gospel. They didn't come at this list of things to do through faith. They are those who are trying to bring their own works to the table. They've forgotten that they were cleansed by the work of Christ. You see, it is not our works that justify us. It is faith. But true faith always produces good works. The Lord knows that you will be tempted to give up the fight. He knows that there will be times when certain sins of doubt, fear, anxiety, lust, anger, whatever they may be that you're struggling with right now, will make you feel hopeless. Like Christian, when he stepped off the path and ended up in the castle of doubt, chained up in the dungeons where it was cold and dark, and he had forgotten where he was going. All he knew that he was a prisoner. And maybe we feel like that right now. I mean, we've surely felt that way before. He knows that Satan will throw every reason and the world at you for giving up the fight. He will even spiritualize them with phrases like, let go and let God. I can hear the demons right now whispering their lies. He's demanding too much of you. 
He wants you to give up the fight. He'll take over for you. He knows you can't beat it. He just wants you to depend on Him more. But that's not what the Lord demands or requires of us. He has given us His divine power through the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us so that we might hold fast and make every effort in the midst of trials, showing that our faith is genuine. Upon his journey, Christian's one thought was making it to the celestial city because he had a faith that the Lord of that city would grant him entrance. And Peter holds out the same thing to us. To those who have answered the call of Christ to follow him, may the joy of entering into his city to be with him forever be our motivation in making ever, every effort and not becoming complacent, but making every effort to persevere in patience and doing good. Listen one more time to the words of 2 Peter chapter 1. I just want to close with just reading the passage one more time. 2 Peter chapter 1. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment of silence as the musicians come, and we'll sing one last song together. <laughs>